Good morning, everyone. It's good to be uh, worshiping the Lord again. It's a, uh, been blessed again in my studies. Uh, John 19 is uh, the uh, crucifixion story of jo that John writes. And so it's been a blessing again to, to see what Jesus did for us and to understand um, the cost that, that was involved in uh in Jesus' death and resurrection. <clears throat> so just uh, briefly thinking back to the end of last week's uh, message, John 18. So Jesus was being held by Pilate already. He had been uh, been taken and was being held. Uh, we read that Jesus indicated to Pilate that his kingdom is not of this world. So that, that kind of came out a few times throughout... Uh, in John that he talks about his kingdom not being part of this world um, if that was the case his followers would fight he says <clears throat> he also talked to Pilate about truth and uh, he says if uh, if we how's that? he tells us that if we are of the truth, we will listen to his voice. And I think that goes, that is still the same today. And then as, as a lot of people, Pilate asks, what is truth? And basically, Pilate was standing in the presence of truth at that point. At the end of the chapter, we find Pilate convinced that Jesus was innocent. And throughout today's uh, study as well, Pilate is convinced that Jesus is innocent. <clears throat> when he wants to release Jesus, the Jewish leaders want, want to crucify him. They ask instead for Barabbas to be set free and Jesus to be crucified. So it was custom, I think, that uh, one person would be set free at this time, maybe, possibly. And uh, so they ask for a confirmed robber, a confirmed uh, criminal to be set free, and Jesus, who was no criminal, was uh, to be crucified. So going into uh, um, John 19, maybe we'll read it right now. All right, so this is then uh, John 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him on with their hands. <clears throat> Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. <clears throat> he entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You have no authority over me at all unless it is, has been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. <clears throat> From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. 
They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. <clears throat> so they took Jesus and went, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is in Aramaic, which in Aramaic is called Gabatha, or Golgotha. Sorry, there they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, "Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews." Many of the Jews read this inscription. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests and the, of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, King of the Jews, but rather, This man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. <clears throat> when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was a f to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross Jesus of Jesus were his mother and his his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus said, saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And he said to his, his disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. <clears throat> Since it was the day of preparation, and so the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that they might, that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it was born, has borne witness. His testimony is true. He knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took, took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, a, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh, aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with spice, the spices as the burial cut. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they lead, laid Jesus there. <clears throat> so that's uh, uh, quite a uh, reading there about how Jesus suffered. And I guess I had to think about the suffering of Jesus and, uh, and the cost of salvation I also realized that it was not only because 
that it was only because of the real love that Jesus had for humans through time, which reaches down to each of us, that this could be a reality for us. Jesus didn't have to do this, but because of his love for those who didn't love him in return, he paid the price for our sins. So let's see some of the costs to Jesus uh, through this uh, story here. Uh, talks about Jesus being flogged. Uh, in, in Roman times, this flogging was very painful. It was done with the whip uh, with many strands of leather, and on the strands there was embedded sharp pieces of bone and metal. This was used on Jesus' back, and because of this, his back would have been extremely lacerated. So kind of at the start of all this, he was, uh, his back was torn to pieces. In the words of Barclay, it literally tore a man's back into strips. Few remained conscious through the ordeal. Some died and many went raving mad. <clears throat> so the soldiers, when, when you look at how they uh, treated Jesus, they didn't realize who it was that they were, they were uh, playing with here. They continued to mock him. They uh, twisted up thorn branches and uh, put it on his head as a crown. I think this would have been very painful. His body would have been very mistreated already. There would have been blood flowing from his wounds on his back and his head. And uh, to add insult to injury, they uh, put on a purple robe onto him. The purple robe, or dark red or whatever it was, what they call purple was uh, was a sign of wealth, and often a king would wear purple clothes because it was a very expensive process to make it that color. <clears throat> this was used to humiliate Jesus as well as the Jews. Uh, this was, and Pilate seems to be egging them on a bit with this uh, king of the Jews thing. They're kind of saying to the Jews, so this is the best you can bring. They mock him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They hit him with their hands. Now again we see Pilate saying he can't find any fault in Jesus. And throughout this whole time, he, uh, he realizes that, that Jesus is not who they say he is. It's kind of interesting that Pilate allowed all this stuff to happen to Jesus in in spite of him understanding or believing that he was innocent. But uh, I'm wondering if maybe he was hoping that with all that Jesus had experienced already that people would maybe say it was enough and let him go. I'm not sure. So, um, but talking about a king or kings in this world and uh, the blood that is often shed to uh, to uh, secure a crown and to uh, keep a throne. Many a crown has been secured by blood. So is this. But it is his own blood. Many a throne has been established by suffering. And so is this. But he bears, he himself bears the pain. And that was by Spurgeon. So the blood shed by earthly kings to establish a throne and a crown is usually shed by others for that king. <clears throat> but not so with Jesus. He went through it all. Verses 5 to 11, Jesus is brought out of Pilate's house. Pilate is asking the people here to behold the man. We also have this invitation to look unto Jesus as we look to Jesus, we are invited to see the marks that were made because of his love for us. Sorry, I lost my spot. We look to Jesus we are invited to see the marks that were made because of his love for us. Jesus was the man of men, 
the perfect man, the tested and approved ideal of all humility, of humanity. Whatever the crowd felt, their leaders didn't give them a chance to feel it long. So it would seem like the, the crowds were being egged on by their, the leaders of their day. <clears throat> With great hatred, they shout, crucify him, crucify him. They don't see the Son of God. They see someone who didn't follow the norms of the day. The norms they were so careful to follow, or should we say, have the people follow. This is the third time Pilate says that he doesn't see any fault in Jesus. I can kind of imagine Pilate being uh, getting sick of how these people were pushing and, uh, and giving him orders. And I imagine it was hard for him to to listen to them in spite of knowing that there was nothing that Jesus or nothing wrong with Jesus, if you will. I think he knew that the Jews couldn't crucify Jesus, but he sarcastically told them that they should. Basically told them, well, you go ahead and do it if you think it should be. But then it's interesting, Pilate gets to the root of their anger. They, uh, they talk about this law that they have, that uh, when someone claims to be the son of God, then he is to be put to death. The only difference between Jesus and the others who had tried this was Jesus really was the son of God. And uh, thinking about Pilate, I th really think that he saw something different about Jesus I think he saw that even when Jesus was bleeding, beaten, and spit on, there was something that made him believe that it may be true that Jesus was more than a man. And it talks about him being afraid. I think there was a gr fear growing inside of him of this man, Jesus, that was standing in front of him. I think Pilate wanted Jesus to defend himself as well. He asked him where he was from as he had already asked him. He had already been, it had already been established to him that Jesus' kingdom was not of this world. <clears throat> and just thinking about Pilate in this situation, I'm sure he'd often had people standing in front of him uh, condemned and to, condemned to death, and they would have been um, begging for their lives probably as they stood in front of them in front of him. And uh, I'm, I'm sure Pilate was amazed that Jesus doesn't reply to him in this time. He asked Jesus about uh, whether he realized that he had the power to uh, take his life or to save it. And I think his reply probably startled Pilate. As he said, you would, uh, verse 11, you would have no authority over me at all unless it was given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. I think right there, Jesus condemned his captors. Verses 12 to 16, it is amazing the lengths that the Jews would go to to have Jesus done away with. They here are saying that only Caesar was their king. And I had to think, like, this is the Jews. They've wanted to get out from under the Romans for a very long time. The Romans were their rulers. They were uh, in their country. They were, they were ruling them. Pilate pushes the knife in here as he asks about their king. It isn't hard to imagine the anger of these people. All this happening... Uh, the Romans being their rulers, and then uh, here, they, uh, Pilate is asking them, like talking about their king here, and their king is being judged by the by the very people that were in in charge here. Now, next he talks about the uh, day of preparation for the Pentecost or for the Passover. Just then. I, uh, I found it interesting that uh, this was at Passover time, and I think probably God had a reason for that. Here, Jesus was that very Passover lamb that, uh, 
the type of the, the first Passover was being fulfilled right here, right now. The Jews were religious in their preparation for things, so they're talking, this was a day just before Passover where they were preparing for the Passover. While they were condemning Jesus to death, they were to be preparing for the Passover. It is interesting that Jesus was preparing to be the final Passover lamb. It was because of their sin that the plan of salvation came to be. Not to say that it wouldn't have happened if they hadn't done what they did. God is faithful and would have kept his promise. How sad it is when we play into Satan's hands as we go about our lives, usually unaware of the destruction we are leaving behind. We are not beyond having this happen in our watch. The story is amazingly simple. Jesus gave up what was his rights as the Son of God and came to earth where he was mistreated and killed being innocent. It was his love for you and me that kept him there. Verses 17 to 25, Jesus is now uh, on his way to Golgotha. Uh, it talks about him bearing his cross. It's not known what for sure what this would have weighed, but the weight of this cross could have been anywhere from 100 to 300 pounds. So just think about how Jesus had been mistreated and uh, how he must have, the weakness he must have had. He was probably awake all night, I'm sure, because he was captured the night before. And this was the next morning. He'd been beaten and all those things. He was taken to Golgotha where he was nailed to the cross. The cross was stood up and set in a hole between two other crosses. The sinless between the sinners, remember how Jesus has been handled up to this time. He's already bleeding and bruised. He is spit upon, but that's only physical. I believe Jesus knows what's ahead for him. He knows the cup he needs to drink. He will carry the weight of our sins and the whole world on him to the cross. He will soon be separated from his Father in this state as payment for our sins. Think with me of the suffering Jesus was feeling at this time. Remember that this suffering was something he could have walked away from, but for his love for the human race, including you and I, this plan was set in motion before the world began and is alluded to in Genesis 3.15 after Adam and Eve had disobeyed God, God's direct command. Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his, he, his heel. So looking at verse 18, we can read over this, or I think I can speak for myself anyway, I can read over this at times and kind of miss what's being said. It's something maybe I've done, I've read and heard about for since young, since I've been young, and uh, just had to think about the uh, reality of crucifixion here. The reality of it is that they held his hands and his feet to the cross and pounded large, large nails through each of them. The cross with Jesus attached was set up and dropped into a hole to keep it upright. The Persians invented crucifixion, but you could say that the Romans perfected it. It was the form of execution reserved for the worst criminal and the lowest classes. Crucifixion was designed to make the victim die publicly, slowly, with great pain and humiliation. This was the form of death God chose for Jesus to die, and the death that he submitted to in the will of God. I had to think of Matthew 26, verses 52 to 54. Jesus is talking to Peter after he cut off the uh, man's ear there. And Jesus is just, or he's going to heal. Uh, he says, this is Jesus talking when he's being captured here. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send more, send more than 
twelve legions of angels, but how then should the scripture be fulfilled that it must be so? It was his love for you and me that took him to the cross and held him there. It was his love that finished the plan of salvation. And he says that in verse uh, 54, he talks like, how could this have how could this happen if if it wasn't like this? So as the Romans usually did, Pilate writes Jesus' crimes on a sign and, and it's nailed above him. It reads, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, and the Jews wanted it changed to read that he said he was the king of the Jews. And so because of the how close it was to the city, a lot of people would be seeing and reading this. Um, it was normal to do crucifixions close to the to a town so that lots of people could see and witness and uh, probably to try and keep crime from happening too much. It was written in three languages so that everyone that came should be able to read it. Now, uh, Pilate tells him what's written, what he's written is written, and I think it was kind of law that they couldn't change what was there once it was there. There are many prophecies that were fulfilled through this uh, time. One of them was Jesus' clothes would be divided by playing games for them. It is amazing to see the detail with which the prophecies were fulfilled. And they were fulfilled by people who didn't know or love God. How often we play games in our lives as life goes by and never give a second thought to what we are doing. That was what was happening here. So the soldiers had no... They didn't care about God. They didn't know about God. They actually fulfilled prophecy. Verse 25 to 27, Consider Jesus at this time. I think about how Jesus was faring by now. Many, How many of us in a situation like this would be thinking about someone else? Jesus has been abused most of the day already. He was captured the night before. Physically, I'm sure he was already quite tired and weak. I'm sure it was hard for Jesus to focus on anything but the pain and weakness. Whatever the case, he talks to his mother and his disciple John, who was the writer of this, this uh, chapter. He tells John to look after Mary, his mother. John indicates that he did this after Jesus' death. We aren't told where Joseph was in all this, but it would seem that he may have died before Jesus' ministry. Verses 28 to 32 is a record of Jesus' death. There was a time when all things were accomplished, when Jesus actually became the target of God's wrath and judgment for, of sin, when he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Um, Jesus became a target became targeted because of our sins. And because of that, we can have righteousness that he has. He can help us and give that to us. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. See in these verses the love God had for us. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons, up to this point, Jesus hadn't taken anything to refresh himself as he hung on the cross. Now the work was almost complete. Now he asked for sour wine to help him be able to speak. The hyssop branch could point back to the time in Egypt when the blood was applied to the doorposts of the Israelites' homes. The words, it is finished, have long been the cry of a winner. Jesus had finished the eternal purpose of the cross. It stands today as a finished work, the foundation of all Christian peace and faith, paying in full the debt we owed to God, making peace between God and man. At some point before he died, before the veil was torn in two, before he cried out, it is finished, an awesome spiritual transaction took place. God the Father laid upon God the Son all the guilt and wrath our sin deserved, and he bore it in himself perfectly, totally satisfying the wrath of God for us. 
Jesus died with the cry of a victor on his lips. This was not the moan of defeat, nor the sigh of patient resignation. It is the triumphant recognition that he has now fully accomplished the work that he came to do. It was all finished, paid in full, accomplished. The types, the promises, the prophecies were finished. The sacrifices and ceremonies of the priesthood were finished. His perfect obedience was finished. The satisfaction of God's justice was finished. The power of Satan, sin, and death was finished. At this point, he bowed his head and gave his life for us. No one took his life. He gave it for us. His death was voluntary. It was a voluntary surrender, a surrender which he had authority to make because the authority to surrender his life was accompanied with an authority to take it up again. Again, we see the love Jesus had for the world, bent on seeing him die, seeing that it was the preparation day for the Passover. After his death, it seems the Jews needed these crosses to be cleared away. The bodies were not to hang over the Sabbath or the Passover beyond that. The legs were broken to help speed up death in those crucified again see the fulfillment of prophecy as jesus had no broken bones he was already dead verses 33 to 37 instead of breaking jesus legs they pierced his side this was another fulfillment of prophecy john is given giving an assurance that he was there and that he in that he is writing sorry let me say that again John is giving his assurance that he was there and what he is writing is factual. He confirms that prophecy has been fulfilled. Verses 38 to 41. uh, After Jesus' death, two, two of Jesus' timid followers, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, asked Pilate for his body. As was the practice at the time, they put spices onto Jesus' body and wrapped it in strips of linen cloth. In this way, they showed their love and support for Jesus in an open way, so they were not so timid anymore. So in closing, that is a lot to say about Jesus' death and what he faced, but he chose to do this for you and for me. Very simply though, through it all, we can see his love for us. It is because of his death on the cross that we can have peace with God. The penalty for sin is death. Because of Jesus' death, the price for our sins has been paid. We have been forgiven. I ask us all, if you haven't given your heart to Jesus, or if you have if you have, and find yourself thinking it's no big deal to think about what it costs our Lord to buy forgiveness for us, I encourage us all to see what he did for us so long ago and to respond to him in repentance, and ask for forgiveness, and live a changed life because of this great gift. It is finished. It is enough. I want to read Colossians 2, 13 and 14. And you who were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, and by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Because of this, we can have peace. I pray that we may all be able to feel and others may be able to see the change brought by a relationship with him. May the Lord bless you and all of us through the coming week. Thank you for sharing this with us and uh, I pray that we may be blessed. Let's just have a word of prayer before we uh, close here yet. Our Father in heaven, I thank you so much for the gift that you gave for us. Thank you that Jesus was willing to die, uh, to come and to die, to leave what he had and to uh, do this for his love for us. Thank you for your love and for making this way possible for us. Pray that you would help us to um, come to know you and to love you. And for those who do not know you, Lord, pray that you would help them to understand this gift, to receive this gift, and to live for you. 
Pray that you would be with us this coming week. Thank you for blessing us as you do. Pray that you would give wisdom to those in charge of the country and and whatever all in the uh, health care things at this time. Pray that you would give wisdom and just give us courage to face the things that are coming and uh, just help us to be a blessing to those around us and uh, by our lives shine a clear light for those around us. Bless us and keep us now and keep us in your will. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.